Okay, hello and welcome to the July 21st Capitol of Planning Commission meeting. The recording is for California Senate Bill 361. The meeting is not for the public. The commission is exempt on meeting via Zoom and there are several ways for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting is in Zoom or a landline or mobile phone, along with how to submit public comments during the meeting tonight, is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, on the slide shown now, and on the public meeting agenda. And as always, this meeting is cablecast live on Charter Communication, Cable TV Channel 8 in Capitola, and 25 for Santa Cruz County. It's being recorded to be replayed at on the following Monday and Friday at 1 p.m. Meetings can also be viewed live on YouTube or on our city's website. Tonight, our technicians are Victor Gerber, Victor Herman, and Eric Johansson. So with those preliminaries out of the way, uh, we are ready to begin the uh, meeting of roll call. We have a roll call, please. Yes, please. Commissioner Christensen. Commissioner Newman. Here. Commissioner Westman. Here. Commissioner Roof. Commissioner Roof. I was muted. Here. Okay. Chair Wick. Here. Okay, we'll now move on to new business and oral communications. Our, uh, are there any uh, items of new business or all communications you wish to bring up? You know, I actually think there might be an oral communication I'd like to uh, bring up, simply because I noticed this meeting was advertised in the Santa Cruz Sentinel. I guess because of the notion of we're talking about a hotel. And if there are people online, I would like to make it clear that this hotel we're talking about is not First Street Mall Hotel but is a, another, a, a different hotel near the Quality Inn uh, by the post office. So if, if you're worried about those other hotels, don't worry that we're not discussing that this meeting. So with that, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Yes, um, well, no, um, there, the only, we had added public comment that was made. Um, there was an email received, I think around like 4 p.m. from the hotel, from a neighbor for item 6D and then also a response to the, um, from the hotel owner following that. So there have been two public, additional public comments made since the packet was released for item 60, 720 Hill Street. So are we gonna add those to the agenda? Are we gonna go over those when that item comes up? Yeah, I just wanna have it in the record that we, we did receive two public comments. Okay, very good. Any other additions or deletions? Okay, let's move on to public comments. This is an opportunity now for the public to weigh in on items that are not on the agenda. You have three meet, three minutes to uh, speak on any items that are not on the agenda. Are there any uh, Zoom calls with the raised hands or texts or emails coming in? And Katie, you're on mute. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, and my dog is barking. I apologize for that as well. There are no hands raised um, from the attendees on Zoom. And I'm checking the public comment email. Um, And I'm gonna to have to ask uh, Planner Sasanto to look at his version because for some reason, my public comment email is not showing up. So Sean, can you tell me if you see any public comment? We have not received any new comments since the ones you mentioned already. Okay, thank you. Very good then. Are there any commission commissioner comments? Hearing none, let's see, do I do I check to see if I can do the hands raised thing? I don't see any hands raised there. So we'll move on then to staff comments. I, staff, I do have one comment. Um, our city council is going to be going back to in-person meetings. 
in August, and the Planning Commission has the option to start in-person meetings starting September 1st. Um, so I would like some feedback on that and um, moving to, it'll be hybrid. There'll be a, a set of guidance, the guidance document that comes out regarding hybrid meetings, but um, that would be published by that August meeting and the planning commission can go live in person September 1st. So could we also go live August at the same time? No, you would want to check it out first. I'd like them to be the to test it out first because they have IT staff on site when they have their meetings. And okay, do you want to just have a show of hands then as to who would like to, uh, or a roll call as to who would like to start uh, hybrid meetings in September? That'd be great. I don't know if it's not on the agenda, but we could say this we're adding this to the agenda. Yeah, we. What a, yeah. Are there any uh, comments with regards to this by the by the commissioners? Anybody wish to argue one way or the other? Uh, this is Commissioner Westman. If nothing changes, you know, COVID-wise, then I would be happy to go back to meeting in person. Does anybody disagree with that? Uh, I hear, I see no hands raised. I hear no comments. It's, I think you got your answer. Uh, Katie, we'd like to. We'd also like to uh, go hybrid and start in September. Uh, Commissioner Newman has his hand. No, acceptable. That's acceptable. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do we have any minutes to approve? I don't think so. Nor do we have anything. Oh, yes, or consent items. None. Okay. Very good. So let's. Finally, move on to item. Oh, what are we at? Item six, public hearings. Uh, item number one is the blanket. Uh, item A, blanket CDP and design permit for the street dining. Uh, Katie, do we have a staff presentation? We do. I'm going to ask um, Sean to turn off his presentation, and I will share my screen. <laughs> He's just protecting you. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so thank you. Um, sorry, my dog is being very naughty. Uh, I have a Zoom notification up. Okay, I got it down. Okay, so tonight before you, we have a blanket coastal development permit and a design permit for prototype street dining decks. I'm going to give you an overview of the program and what the short history of what's happened. And then we have Michael Arnone and Associates here this evening to give you an update on the design. After that, we have um, a couple of key questions that I have for the Planning Commission with the design moving forward and looking for an approval tonight on the blanket coastal development permit. However, if you feel it's not ready at this time, we can always continue this item to the next meeting. Um, there we go. So for the background in December 9th, 2021, the city council adopted an outdoor dining ordinance. The coastal commission I did a conditional approval in July, on July 14th. The two items that they modified during their conditional approval was to require recertification. Um, so after three years, we need to take all of the coastal development permits that are issued for the, temp for the outdoor dining uh, to city council for review and ensure that they're in compliance and there's no impacts to coastal resources and coastal access. Um, the second change the Coastal Commission made was to remove the requirement for dedicated funds. Originally, there was a requirement for 50% of the parking funds to go towards coastal access. Um, we drafted 
a document stating how much we actually spend on coastal access. And they, um, they found that we're, we're going above and beyond and took that requirement away. So on June 23rd, the city council accepted the Coastal Commission's new conditions. And just last week, the Coastal Commission certified our ordinance. So it is now part of our LCP. Um, so quick reminder of what, how this works. So tonight you have the prototype design in front of you that you'll be reviewing. The Planning Commission will review it and um, essentially approve a blanket coastal development and design permit for the prototype design. Once that's approved, restaurants may utilize the prototype design. It will be at no cost and no additional public review process. Um, however, they will need to get a building permit and an encroachment permit will be required. And they'll also um, start paying, will pay rent on the spaces utilized. The other option that businesses have is to do a custom design. Um, the custom design, they can submit a custom design to the planning department. It requires a coastal development from planning commission and then also a building permit and permit would follow. Um, so where, where, how did we get to where we are today? Seventh, I brought this item before you for the first time and uh, Jennifer from Mike Larno and Associates presented. Um, and the planning commission gave us feedback on the design. This is all in the staff report. I don't want to read through the whole list, um, but mm -hmm. they, all the items that um, were brought up by planning commission have been addressed in our new uh, design. One of the main points, one, one, a couple of like highlights of that evening was there was a preference for the concrete planters. So that's included in the design and that was because of the weight of the planters and how it could be a, a, could have a double function for safety of, with cars. Um, and then the other was um, just to, uh, we took away the, the wooden fencing option and just and introduced two different colors of uh, the, the railings and also an all planter option. Um, sorry. And then looks like I'm missing a slide. I apologize. But we also met with our local businesses and in meeting with the local businesses, there was a lot of feedback of um, wanting to utilize some of the, um, to, to not be held to the standard of some of the uh, furniture designs within the prototype design. There was also comments about, they felt like there was ways to design the deck in which more seating could become available through creating like bar a bar space around the edge which if you've gone out and seen the Capitola wine bar, they've introduced that to their, their temporary dining now. Um, so, and there were several other uh, comments made at, from, the, from the businesses that were also included in your packet. Um, so next, um, the updates are here. So the, the concrete planners, there's now uh, three different color options included in the prototype design. Um, a wood planter option was added with a countertop bar and a built-in bench. Um, that will be introduced tonight by Michael Arnone. Um, that I am hoping to get feedback from the planning commission. Um, with the two options, I'm looking for feedback of do you want to stick with only one or do you want to allow two different options in the village? Um, they added stanchions with heavy duty ropes to create that separation between the street dining decks and the sidewalk. We checked in the businesses asked, does it comply with ABC regulations? And it does to have those stanchions. Um, and then for ADA, we need six feet of clearance to get onto a dining deck. So that's been, that's included as well added options for the metal railings, both aluminum and black, remove that solid wood option. And we added an option of planters only. Um, and another thing that came up was adding the angled parking option. Uh, some businesses said they would rather utilize the bicycle and loo options. So therefore they'd like to max out the angled parking. So there's a new option for angled parking. Um, and then, we also received comments from the businesses that the metal seats may be hot 
And so there's now a third option by BFM seating for synthetic teak and aluminum frame chairs and tables. And um, there's a standard heaters. The heaters that are most common are now in the plan. So tonight when we, after Michael's presentation, I would like feedback from the planning commission of whether or not we should include the wood planter option. Um, and also feedback on the furniture. I, I do think it's important that we have a high standard for the furniture that is in these locations. Over the, uh, the past three summers, you know, it's been a pandemic. We understand that the furniture is not perfect when we have a temporary situation. But moving forward, this design is really going to be part of um, our, our beautiful village. And I think having a high standard to make sure that the furniture for the future really can withstand the elements is important. Um, but we did get a lot of feedback from the um, businesses of wanting a little more flexibility there. So I'd like input from the Planning Commission on that. I have it conditioned currently limiting to three different manufacturers that are uh, included in the prototype. However, I also said, if I put in a condition that if they want an, to, an alternative, they could take that to planning commission for approval. Um, so I look forward to that discussion. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike Larnone and associates and I'll stop my sharing. And I apologize for my dog, sorry. <laughs> Uh, hi, everybody, uh, commissioners and public and uh, staff. Uh, Katie did a, a you know, really good job of uh, introducing you know, what we were going to show. Uh, I'm going to let Jennifer grab the screen because she's going to kind of lead the presentation. So, Jennifer, you want to just start to share the screen. Um, I, again, as Katie mentioned, you know, we took the feedback from the last planning commission meeting. We took the feedback from uh, the people uh, the, you know, the restaurant owners and, and the wine bar people and the pub and everybody. Um, and we tried to address, you know, the majority of the comments, you know, based on, uh, you know, our design experience. So um, there are some changes. And I think we've addressed, you know, again, most of the things that uh, we had, uh, you know, concerns about or folks had concerns about. So um, I think I'll probably interject some things as Jennifer gets into the presentation, but I'll, I'll just let her start on this and then uh, I may hop in here. Um, first thing I was going to mention uh, is the the stanchions, you know, we talked about and I and I want one of the commissioners wanted something a little more heavy duty or secure. And the reason that we went back to the stanchion with like, you know, kind of like what you see in a bank, you know, to steer people through the, the uh, maze of the bank um, is because it is very flexible in terms of cleaning, uh, in terms of how did we change the access to a certain part of the, um, to the parklet. Um, also, it just has to sit on top of that grate, as you kind of see at the bottom of the page here. Um, if it gets something really serious, it has to be constructed inside onto the wood. And of course, that makes this even smaller. So we we're trying to maximize the seating capacity and that's kind of how we ended up with the, you know, going back to that stanchion thing. Um, so anyway, with that, uh, Jennifer, if you want to go through this, the, that'd be great. Sure, sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, so we'll start with the first option for the angled uh, parking places. So this option for the perimeter, you can see there are concrete planters alternating with this uh, dash line represents the, the metal railing. Um, so similar to what you guys saw the first time, but this time it's all, all concrete planters and railings. Um, the circles down here with the dash line are the, are the stanchions and rope that Mike was just talking about. Um, and we kind of reduced the size of the wheel stop. I think there was some concern last time about how would a bike actually get in there. So before they were a little longer, um, about six feet. So these are kind of reduced down to four. Um, let's see, second option is the perimeter is just all concrete planters and, and no railings. Um, and the advantage to that would be uh, pretty simple to install and um, a really nice sturdy barrier around, you know, around the perimeter. Um, same layout with, with the portable stanchions. 
And then uh, the third option is the one Katie was asking for feedback about. This is a new option where the perimeter or part of the perimeter is a wood planter, um, which is this area right here, uh, with an option of like an integrated bench and a bar height counter. So it offers a little more flexibility in seating if, if, there, if the restaurant owners wanted to add a longer table here or something like that, might be a little bit more space efficient. Um, and again, same uh, uh, pedestrian traffic control stanchions there. And then this is the elevation of the first two options, the concrete planter and metal railing, or just all concrete planters on the perimeter. And this is the wood planter option, kind of a section elevation view and also a little bit of a 3D view that kind of gives you an idea uh, conceptually of how it would look. This is a bar height uh, countertop and then or, or a built-in bench. And then the next two options, um, Katie talked about this in the introduction. If restaurant owners were to do the in-lieu uh, parking place or bike parking, we could kind of change the layout of the platform so that it matches or conforms to this, this parking striping, which gives a little bit more, you know, square foot area uh, for that dining deck and, and more table options. This particular option is a really simple perimeter of just railing and, and concrete planters. And then this option uses that wood planter to create, you know, a really enclosed, um, pretty custom, um, you know, built-in bench option and um, bar seating option. And then moving to the parallel parking, um, components are pretty much the same as, as the angled parking. Um, you know, just obviously in a different layout that's um, not as deep. Uh, here we're using the wheel stops more to protect, you know, from people parallel parking there. So we're going back to the to the longer wheel stop, still have the portable um, pedestrian traffic control. Um, and then this would be the perimeter option of all concrete planters. A perimeter option along the street of a wood planter with a built-in countertop, uh, I'm sorry, bar height counter and, um, you know, movable table seating. And then elevation um, railing and planters or just planters. And then moving on to the platform itself, um, options for the decking would be a natural, like a redwood decking or a composite wood decking. This is kind of a schematic of, of the section, how the platform integrates with the uh, storm, uh, the gutter and um, gutter and grate and sidewalk and roadway, kind of along here on the bottom. And I think you guys saw this detail last time, but this is kind of how um, the steel trench grate and you know meets uh, the curb at the sidewalk and the platform, and then along the perimeter, uh, a steel um, perforated steel, something that allows water to drain under the deck. These are the railing options: a metal railing, either an aluminum color or a black. These are the concrete planters that we're recommending. This photo shows um, the planters at an outdoor dining deck in Los Gatos. Um, and you can actually go there and see them in person if you're interested. It's in Katie's um, her staff report, the address. Uh, new bike rack just to accommodate more bikes wheel stop. These are the um, 
portable stanchions and rope. Uh, suggested uh, dining furnishings. Um, this company, Emu, has a lot of different options that are pretty pretty widely used, um, and they're in a in a pretty easy price point for people to afford, which is kind of why we went we suggested them. But they have a lot of different options in terms of style and color, pretty good lead times. Um, this particular set is available through like an online web web restaurant store. It's called, you know, something really simple for people to order. And also same with this one. This is the option with a synthetic uh, teak um, tabletop and, and then also on the chairs because people were concerned about them getting metal getting too hot. Um, umbrellas that you saw before, a standard heater, patio heater. Jennifer, can I interrupt you right there one second sure. about the heaters? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know there was a there was a period over the spring when one of the one of the restaurants down there allowed these heaters. the The deflector on the top was bent and cocked at a crazy angle, and it just looked really trashy. They had a couple of them like that, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if it'd make more sense to not allow this type of heater, but to allow the kind that are enclosed in glass and, and pyramidal, pyramidal shape to tall pyramid shape? Um, yeah, I, I think we could offer that option. I guess that's kind of up to staff too, if, if Katie wants to comment. We um, actually went out and I just assessed what the restaurants have and the majority of them have the standard heater that we've shown in the plan. Um, but you are correct. There's a, there's um, some of them are, are looking really um, weathered. And I think at that point, we, you know, the conditions that are tied to the prototype design is that they, if they are looking weathered and um, not looking fresh, they, they would need to be replaced. So. Well, why don't we just require that right now? If the, if the commission approves that, because we're going to all this trouble to create these really nice designs, but yet we're allowing heaters that can look pretty shabby after. Yeah. So right, the, the, the temporary um, outdoor dining goes through September 15th, but after that, everything would have to comply with the new, they'd have to have, you know, invest into this new prototype and be in compliance. Okay, I'll bring that up when we discuss it at the commission level then. Okay. Um, the string lights and poles, I think you guys saw those last time. And then in terms of plants, um, this is the suggested plant list and people, you know, in this column, they can kind of see, you know, choose according to what sun exposure they have, sun, you know, sun shade. Um, and we might be able to reduce this. I know that there was a concern that a lot of the plants aren't looking so great. Um, I think if we lean more towards succulents, um, that don't require a lot of pruning and things, um, that might be a way to kind of make sure everything looks looks good and is easy care. But um, we have quite a few succulents in the list. So, um, and I think that's everything. So I'll add in uh, a couple of things. Again, the you know, the designs that we tried to do were based on a certain number of parking spaces. Um, the uh, dining, you know, things that are out there now uh, vary greatly. Um, you know, some of them, uh, like on the Cap Ave by the brewery, uh, they have two uh, parallel spaces, and, and we're representing that on, I guess, on page five. Um, Along the Esplanade, it's quite different. There's, you know, they kind of are splitting up a couple. So there's Mr. Toots has like one and a half spaces. Paradise Beach, I believe, you know, roughly has four and a half spaces. So they kind of share, you know, maybe the entries uh, between that half space. The Sandbar, I think, has three and a half. The Thai Place has two. Uh, on San Jose, uh, the Wine Bar has one and a half. The Hot Dog Place has one and a half. 
I believe Caruso's has two. So they're all kind of different. Um, and so when we get into the, you know, construction drawings for these, if we, if we take it there, um, you know, we're going to have to be very site specific in terms of how many spaces they actually want uh, and how the design is going to fit into those spaces. So there's, you know, there's some work to do here, but I mean, this, I think hopefully gives you uh, an idea of, of what we're shooting for in terms of the aesthetics uh, of, you know, what we want the thing to look like and, you know, well, what the city, you know, wants the, the, the outdoor dining areas to look like. So. With that, um, we're happy to answer any questions. That concludes the presentation this evening. So this is Commissioner Westman. I have a couple questions. Uh, I wonder if uh, Mr. Arnone could, uh, they're introducing this wood uh, element, uh, the wood decks, the wood outside. And I wonder if he could talk a little bit more about you know, what kind of wood that's going to be? Are they going to be painted? Are they going to be stained? Um, you know, how do we guarantee that, you know, somebody's going to use high quality materials in building something like this? Um, and also we went with the concrete planners because we felt they provided more safety. And how does the this wood option compare to the concrete planners as far as safety? Yeah, uh, I mean uh, the the brew pub on uh, Cap Ave has you know recently put in uh, an all wooden perimeter of plants uh, of planters, um, and it you know looks nice. They they painted the wood. I'm not sure what color, what type of wood they used. I think it's redwood. Um, and they painted it to match the front of their building and it's, you know, it's totally self-enclosed. In terms of, you know, security, I mean, I'll answer that part of the question first. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult for me to say. I mean, if somebody's coming in at, and just happens to be driving five miles an hour and they just steer into it, I think the wood thing would be fine. If somebody has the intent of, you know, running into the thing, uh, certainly the concrete would be more uh, protection for the people that are in there. So, I mean, it, it really depends on the nature of what happens and I, and I can't predict that, you know, nor can you. So um, I think the wood, you know, is a, is a viable option. Um, I think the concrete certainly has a different look, um, but I think both, you know, would be a fairly good barrier. I mean, you're, you're, the worst case is if somebody deliberately goes into this thing and I don't know if we have any way to protect anybody at that point, but if it's just somebody who's on their phone who happens to steer, you know, not pay attention to where they're going and they slide into the thing, certainly the wood will alert them, you know, of what's happening. So, um, I mean, that's that's probably, Susan, the best <laughs> explanation that I can make on that. Uh, in terms of the decking, um, I think the, you know, the composite material that will hold up with the weather would, wouldn't need to be painted, wouldn't need to be stained. Uh, doesn't need, you know, wouldn't splinter. Uh, that would probably be the, the best choice. Uh, and again, you know, one of the, the big comments that we heard when we met or talked to the, uh, the restaurant folks was the cost of all this. So, you know, we're trying to weigh, we're trying to provide options that are, you know, affordable at the same time, you know, meet the aesthetics of the city. So um, if they do use redwood, then, you know, it probably would be stained um, if they use, um, you know, again, that's an, a, a topic that the, you know, the staff could comment on and, and we could review that, but. It, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about it later. It just seems to me that the wood opens up a whole, uh, area that we really haven't addressed. Who's going to decide what color they should be painted? Who's going to decide, you know, whether they should be stained, how that's going to look. And uh, for me personally, I would disagree with you. I, I, I think the color that's gotten painted on Capitola Avenue is, is not a particularly good choice for our, our town and how it works. So we can talk about that later when the commission discusses this. Hey, Commissioner Newman. Stand up. Okay, um, well, 
this is obviously a great improvement over what we have there. And uh, I commend uh, the uh, architect and his staff, but my questions are for staff and they're totally off point. So I apologize in advance, but um, my question is if I want to open a new restaurant in the village with indoor seating, do I have to satisfy any parking requirements? And if I want to open or expand a restaurant in the village with just outdoor seating, do I have to satisfy any parking requirements? Um, so if you owned a retail shop or an office within the city and you wanted to convert that to restaurant, you would be limited to 160 square feet of seating area or area in which your customers could be within. Um, so that, that's the limitation there before having to provide parking. If you had an existing restaurant and wanted to do outdoor seating, um, your, there's, we'll talk about outdoor seating within your property first. And under our new code, you're allowed to do an addition. Um, you're allowed to expand your restaurant or provide outdoor dining as long as it's not, um, and I'm going to ask Plenar Freilich to correct me if I'm wrong, but as long as it's not greater than 20% of the existing uh, floor area of your restaurant, then you're allowed to expand up to 20%. And that can be either within expanding into an interior space within your existing building or within outdoor dining on your property. The third um, part of this is within our street dining and sidewalk dining, there is no requirement for outdoor for parking that's tied to the new uh, street dining ordinance. And another portion of this, just to put one more layer on it, is that the governor passed a law, which I think goes through 2025, I think it's December of 2025, that cities uh, do not, uh, it maybe cannot require parking for outdoor dining. They're exempt through 2025. So it's a sunset clause. So if we were to see a, a, an outdoor dining application, we would definitely want to make sure that it's reviewed after the sunset. Um, so four, four different answers for you, Commissioner Newman. I won't waste time on this because I know we have a lot to do. I was going to kind of go through the history of uh, the, co the Coastal Commission and the parking requirements and all the things that we've done in the last 40 years or so, but that which all has been exploded here, but it is what it is. So, uh, sorry. I will comment that um, when we submitted the street dining to the Coastal Commission, they, it seems like they've had a major shift in their thinking about parking spaces uh, related to outdoor dining and that outdoor dining um, is a form of uh, some, something that the public can enjoy. And it's, um, it's providing another opportunity for those who maybe don't want to go to the beach, but would like to sit and eat and take in the view of a coastal area. So they, they were supportive of that notion. They did really, um, they thought it was great that we had the bicycle parking included so that there was some mitigation, but they are moving away. There's a shift happening away from the car, so. Okay, so I have a question um, as well. A couple of them, first of all, uh, as a part of the um, conditions of this, um, activity uh, is going to be with regards to storage like you know junk storage propane tanks that kind of thing are they is there going to be conditions that make sure that that is not kept in the outdoor dining area we can add that condition i know that we discussed that before the other question was you eliminated the wooden railing but i thought when we discussed it last time it was like we didn't like the solid wooden fence but I didn't think we objected to wooden railing. Am I, is that, is that your recollection? Um, I, I think it was that you didn't like 
the comments were about having that solid. So we just did away with that railing altogether. Um, okay. Okay. Well, I guess I don't have any objection. My, my, my finally, uh, my, my real comment, however, has to do with, uh, with plants. And the reason I bring this up is because I think because of all the exceptions and all the options, we're, we're slowly getting away from any notion of a common theme or a common look that Capitol has. I know we're trying to go high quality, but, and this might be only my issue, but it's, you know, I was hoping that when, at least when you went into the village, you'd say, oh, okay, the, this, is the, this is the common theme of Capitola, be it, you know, whether the, what the planters look like or the railing looks like, it's like, okay, you, you feel you're in Capitola because there's, a, there's something, I don't know what it is, but it would be something that would be consistent uh, with all the outdoor dining spaces so that it, it would be, it would blend it all together. And my thought today is when we're talking about plants, uh, there's a huge listing of plants and at least in the village, wouldn't it be possible to like have a, a plant, like we're doing nothing but My Myers ferns and all these planters and that's what looks great. But I'm just thinking back a long time ago, I visited Victoria, Canada and they had all of these, these uh, light posts with the planters and they all had the exact same flowers in them. And it was gorgeous when they all came in bloom. And it was like, well, okay, maybe, maybe that's what, Maybe that's what we do with Capitola. It make, get, that's the common theme is we all have these beautiful such and such plants. And I would think that the village at least is consistent in terms of light and shade and heat and all that and moisture that we could probably pull that off. So my question, I guess, to um, staff or the, app, the uh, presenters are, is that, is that a practical idea from a standpoint of yeah, the environment is consistent, and yeah, you can have a plant or maybe two plants that would that we could we could impress upon the applicants um, when they when they plant their planters. This is a prototype, so um, it, if the commission uh, so chose to limit it to certain plant types, that's um, to further limit it because we have I don't know how many Jennifer how many plants we have currently it's a but lot. <laughs> there's quite a few so yes that is that's definitely an option whatever you put in these plants are what will have to be followed okay so there's no technical reason why we could now opt for that that you can come up with yeah i think Very that good. yeah having a, a sun option a couple sun options one or two and a couple shade options I, yeah i think that would work um, I'll, you know, I'll interject, you know, I think part of the beauty of the village and, and of Capitola in general is the unique nature of the architecture. We have all kinds of different styles. Paradise Beach Grill is much different than, than Zelda's and that strip of buildings. I think the, you know, the outdoor dining should reflect, you know, the style of the building and uh, not necessarily be homogenous throughout the village. I mean, I, I that, that's my take on it, Peter. I mean, we, everybody has their opinion <laughs> and I appreciate what you said, but I mean, I, I think the, the design itself for each place should be, you know, uh, it can be unique in, in and of itself. But I mean, the architecture in the village, you know, from the Venetian to, you know, some of the old, older buildings and certainly some of the newer places that are, you know, being built now um, are, are what make Capitola really unique. So I, I, I see the same that same reflection in the parklets, personally. All right, that's a fair comment, thank you. Are there any other questions of staff? Okay, with that, then we can uh, move on to what? Public comments? Yes, I see uh, Reef Dog is in, has a hand up and I'm going to. Um, hey, hey, Katie. <clears throat> Hi, um, my my comment on plants specifically is that I feel like there's a sustainability, um, um, you know, growth that we need to keep uh, going. Um, the plants should be <clears throat> definitely, um, you know, low water content. Um, um, I believe that that any plants that that are planted into the planter boxes um, surrounding the parklet um, uh, be 
be in 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 motion of 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 providing uh, green and and beauty, um, but we are are still in um, we're still in a water uh, you know retention. So we need to we need to protect that, um, and so therefore you know for for instance for my planners. They are definitely uh, low water content. They're sustainable. Um, they're green. They're beautiful. They've grown. Um, certainly, I don't want to rip them out. Um, so, you know, I just hope that the the city and the planning um, take that in consideration as we as we move forward for the type of plants that that are considered for the planter boxes. Okay, thank you. Katie, any other comments? Um, I'm looking to see if there are any other hands up. I see uh, Linda Smith. Linda, you can speak now. You'll have to unmute. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. yes. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna try and be pretty brief here. You guys have heard a lot of my comments in the past and um, I still believe that indoor dining areas are going to be less used than they used to be. I believe that um, the requirement for having more spacious dining areas as long as COVID is out there is going to continue to be a big deal. And the street dining decks can bring that to Capitola. Um, I know that this commission doesn't really support the implement implementation of the outdoor street dining decks across the board. And I think that the prototype design and the path that we're on is probably not going to yield um, what I would consider to be an adequate implementation with the restauranters that we have. I don't think they've been involved enough in this process to really um, help get creative on the solution. So I just have three thoughts I'd like to leave with you. Um, dictating the selection of furnishings really limits a business's opportunity to brand their space. You've got several restaurants that have outdoor spaces already and dictating the kind of furniture that they can use in one outdoor space um, is going to really hodgepodge um, their look and feel. And some of those are outside where they can be seen, and some of them are over on the creek side um, where they won't be seen side by side, but it's still um, very different. And the uh, um, two, in, in all of the information that I saw, there were only two manufacturers that were listed. Um, now I understand there's a third that's there and I haven't looked at that one at all. And they may offer something um, different. Second thought is um, the term consistent with prototype design should really be defined so that it's clear what changes can be made without further PC involvement with the commission. Um, and a lot of the, um, design that I saw has to do with furniture placement within the space. I'm assuming that that's a suggestion and that the restaurateurs will really have the freedom to configure their site, the furniture within their site um, that meets their requirements best. And for example, if they um, chose to have um, two parking spaces in that third entire space dedicated to bicycle parking, they could still do that if their site warranted that. And I think what I heard Mike say was that site specifics could still be worked out um, and would still be considered consistent with the prototype design. Um, and finally, I've been down there at night and um, several of the restaurants that are really interested in continuing with this outdoor dining, they, they kind of act like wind tunnels. And there's no allowance in the prototype for any kind of coverings or wind breaks. Um, the standard heaters, I heard the discussion on the heaters that Mick brought up and there is a configuration of heater down there where the design of the heater includes movable uh, parts of the round top. And there are a couple of different places that have them. And I believe the function is that they can direct the heat down because that type of heater when you're in a windy condition and there's no cover above it, does not really offer an adequate amount of heat in the winter time. Um, the glass heaters, they're gorgeous to look at and psycho-emotionally, when you look at a flame, you think you get warmer because you're looking at a flame, but those heaters do not put off nearly the same amount of heat 
that the, the standard heater that you've got listed does. Um, since we're talking about transitioning right at the end of the season and going into the winter, um, the timing is such that I don't know if there is an allowance for this, but if you could allow um, the take down of the temporary stuff in September, but allow them to put up the new stuff in April or May at the beginning of the next season, rather than putting it in now and then having it sit over the winter where it's gonna get you know, weather worn and will be idle except for those great days that we have um, where you know, we don't have inclement weather, that maybe you could use the parking spaces in the interim as parking spaces and just give the owners, uh, the restaurant guys, uh, time so that they don't have to just sit with that brand new stuff during the most idle part of the year. I'm really hoping that your discussion tonight comes up with some encouragement for the restaurants to participate in this program, because I believe it does bring a vitality. And if we can make it so that, and maybe we, we plan more night uh, events that would draw people out into these areas. A lot of the restaurants have large indoor areas that when it's inclement weather and there's cold evenings and you know when we've been lifting the, the COVID um, restrictions and the tables have been getting crowded in there again, now that we're seeing COVID numbers rise, I think the winter time is a time when we could really help our restaurants out and we could really bring some vibrancy if this program works. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Linda. Katie, anyone else? I Katie. believe that. Uh, so I'm not you break any, it up, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I'm not seeing any more hands up on Zoom, but uh, Sean, can you tell us if there are any comments, written comments? Yes, I do see one comment from a Bob Lashley. And can you do the auto read on that for us? I don't know if I have it set up to do that, but uh, would you like me to display it or, or I can read it out loud if you'd like? Sure, if you uh, want to display it and read it out loud, that'd be great. Sure. So this is from Bob Lashley. Uh, hi, as I'm listening to the discussion around the deck proposals, I realized my first question was probably answered in the previous meetings that discussed the top, this topic. As parking spaces are redesignated as dining areas for restaurants, the amount of parking decreases in the immediate area adjacent to the vendor. In the city designating additional parking capacity somewhere nearby, i.e. the municipal parking structures or new structures, et cetera, a more immediate drop-off area near the redesignated parking spots where elderly or larger groups can be dropped off or picked up prior to the driver seeking out parking elsewhere. Any answers to the above, uh, to the above are appreciated. Thanks, Bob. All right, thank you, Mr. Lashley. Um, Katie, do you want to respond to that at all? Because we did talk about this. Is there a quick answer that you could uh, post or? Uh... So, sure. Um, so I will say that right now there is a, a new parking committee that's formed in Capitola as we're going through uh, our discussions on outdoor dining. Um, the council and planning commission raised concerns for, we, we can't just be looking at only the outdoor dining. We need to look at the entire village uh, comprehensively and look at our permit programs and um, our 20 minute drop off areas. So we are looking, we do have a new parking committee that's been formed and they are looking at things holistically. I will share these comments with our public works director so he's aware and um, this is something they can look at. Being it, a member it, of that parking committee, I got to say that's a that's a, an excellent comment that's worth reviewing.
I believe um, uh, I see Reef Dog Delhi has their hand up again. Um, they did make prior public comment. That's up to you, um, Chair. Well, Will. If we don't have a lot of people raising their hands. It just let's let's just warn them that this is not a discussion. But we, we'll let them weigh in. Go ahead. Okay. I. Anthony, I believe if you unmute yourself, you should be able to speak. Yeah, um, I'll, go, I'll go ahead and pass. Not waste any more time. Go ahead and go back to the board. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I, was, we... I, I was just going to interject about uh, Linda's comment about the furniture. Um, and, and yes, that it isn't. that's not how we're requiring people to have their, their tables and chairs. It was only useful to just kind of give you an idea of, you know, how it could possibly be set up for each configuration um, as long as we have a, you know, a, a, an ADA, you know, space available. Um, but otherwise, you know, if we had left them all blank, we talked about that, but then, you know, I think it, it's easier here, you know, the way we did it just to kind of envision, to help you envision what it could look like, but certainly that, you know, they're allowed to put the furnishings and the tables, however they want. All right. Are we ready to move on to planning commission deliberation? Okay, who would like to start? Um, Susan, I'm gonna assume your hand was up from last time, so I'm gonna let Mick Ruth uh, yeah, start Yeah, it off. was up from last time, thanks. Okay, thank you, Peter. Yeah, I have just a, a few things. I, I know I raised the issue at a previous meeting about curb height in relation to the crown of the road. And I know require, we're requiring the decks to be at curb height, but in one of the renderings, it does show the deck level with the, uh, lesser space between the, the road and the, and the top of the deck. So, uh, have there been any actual measurements been made in the various locations where people want these decks, Katie? Um, so, so there have been, and um, we've spoken with Michael about this. Um, once we figure out who wants to participate in we're going to move to our building plan stage next, but we don't want to go to that stage until we know that there's going to be a participant. Um, so that will be the next phase is once we know where, you know, which restaurant would like to participate, what the slope is in front of their restaurant, the height of the sidewalk versus the angles within the street, then we'll, Michael will design to that standard. But at this point, we're not going to move forward with any building plans until we know we have a participant. Okay, so it's not, it's not a hard and fast condition that the deck be flush with the top of the curb, or it is? No, we're gonna have to work with special circumstances because you're absolutely okay. correct that they're not all the same out there, so. Okay, uh, I'm assuming that bar bike parking at those places if they decide to use that option is public bike parking it is. okay and then i wanted to bring up the heaters again most of the outdoor restaurants that i've eaten at in the last god year year and a half two years most of them all have the pyramidal type heaters now just for aesthetic reasons and they're just easier to operate and so if if the commission is is willing, I'd like to see a condition that those type of heaters are required, just because they are more aesthetically pleasing. If we're going to ask, you know, this applicants to spend this much money on design and and construction of these things, then to me it's reasonable to require some aesthetically pleasing heaters. So I'd like Can to interject. Can I interject, Mick, because on, on that topic, uh, it just occurred to me, well, what about over, overhead electrical heaters? Those are also very warm and uh, not, a, not as obtrusive as taking up floor space. Is that something that's on the list of possibilities? Well, you know, I didn't think of those, but the only time I've ever seen those is when they're being hung for some type of rafter. Right. Oh, uh, well, you, hmm, good point. So, okay, cool. Well, the other, my other thing is, uh, Peter, I agree with you on the, on the, on the narrowing the type of plants down. Uh, you know, Mike mentioned the uniqueness and the variation of the building styles down there, but I see this as part of the streetscape and streetscapes are usually uniform. And I think it would really add to the, 
you know, to the overall beauty of the village, if it were uniform and there were, there were some continuity between the various outdoor places with the same plants and colorful things that grow. So I would, I would support you and in, in your, your efforts to do that. But I would, I would like to get some feedback on the heaters from the council because I would like to see that be made a condition to get rid of some of those ugly old fashioned heaters down there. Uh, well, let, let's t let's take a moment then and weigh in on that. I I'll say that I, I have no objection to specifying a particular type of heater. And I, I think of all the things that you could allow a, a, an, an owner to have some variation on, that would be one of them. Does anybody else want to weigh in on that particular item? Um, this is Susan? Commissioner Westman. I could agree with Commissioner Ruth. I think, you know, um, designating the the type of heater and uh, having the one that has glass on it um, uh, works for me. And I very much agree with Commissioner Ruth's comment about, you know, these are, this is really what they call street furniture going in. This is, these are like street fixtures. And I do think it's important for us to have some consistency just as, um, you know, every city I've ever known has had consistency in its type of street furniture and benches that it puts out. Okay, Courtney. I completely agree with Commissioner Westman and Commissioner Ruth. Um, I, I took a trip to Los Gatos and I'm familiar with the concrete planters and the park, uh, the rail that the picture um, in this in the report or the package depicted. And it's, I mean, they have taken this really <laughs> to heart. It's just, everything is very consistent. There's, um, I think there's stanchions for overhead canopy. And then there's the, the concrete um, planters, plus the, they're pouring concrete, um, you know, pads for the outdoor seating. So, I mean, they're fully committed to keeping these, um, these parklets there. But it just it just really looks uniform, consistent, and intentional. And I think that's kind of where um, is what I'm hearing. And and especially looking at especially the, the restaurants on the Esplanade, it would just be really nice if it was consistent <laughs> and intentional. <laughs> um, and I also agree that um, the the heaters are important. I, I just feel that I really truthfully don't have a preference to which type heaters um, are used, except for the fact that everything is just kept in a, in a refreshed state. So it's not just like um, Commissioner Roofs was saying sideways and crooked, you know, and broken. <laughs> so, um, and then also I wanted to comment on the wood to concrete discussion. Um, I just have, in the overall design and uh, what I've been hearing, what I've been seeing in, in the other towns up here, it's just the concrete is cleaner. <laughs> just looks nicer. Um, I know it's an added expense and I'd like to hear more input on that point, but um, it just looks nicer. It doesn't allow, like Commissioner Westman was mentioning, it doesn't allow for interpretation. It's just, make this happen, make it look nice, put plants in here, keep it fresh, keep it nice. Don't make it feel like we're dining on the street corner. <laughs> it's, it's an intentional area for, you know, um, space, nice, nice area. So any, that's, that's what I had to say. <laughs> Commissioner Newman. Hey, on the, uh the tension between uniformity and uh, sort of eclectic uh, creativity, I, I lean in uh, the direction of Mr. Arnon and uh, think that we should not impose too much of a uniformity. And the re my, re my thinking on that is, is that just the nature of Capitola is that it's, it's always been a um, uh, eclectic uh, community. And on the other extreme, you have um, Mission Viejo or places like that where every place is almost identical. 
in architecture and design and so forth. And I just don't think that's ever been um, the style in Capitola. And I think that the, the upgrade that the plan will result in is sufficient to result in a great improvement over what we have now without trying to make uh, every place look the same. Thank you. Susan, is your hand up again? It's, it's up again. I, I had a couple more items that I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, one of them I think is pretty simple is signage. I don't object to the signage. It's just, I don't think the way it's written right now, it's very clear where the signage is gonna go. Uh, now that we've gone to only having you know, the ropes and the stanchion to separate this area from the sidewalk. Uh, are they going to nail the sign to the stanchions? You know, we certainly don't want them on the other side. You don't want the uh, traffic driving down the esplanade to see the signs on the traffic side of the parking uh, on the on the dining deck. So I just think we need to be a little clearer about um, I think there are two signs that are allowed, a menu sign and then a sign naming the restaurant. And even if we just said something as simple as they need to go on the sidewalk side of the dining deck, uh, that, that would work for me because I don't want to see them on the street side. Um, one other thing I would like to see is now that we're going to these movable stanchions in the rope, um, I think we need some sort of condition in there which says that the dining deck can't encroach on the sidewalk. It's like they can't decide that they wanna make their dining deck bigger by moving these movable stanchions and rope and putting that part on the sidewalk so they have a little more dining space uh, in their dining area. So again, just another simple condition that says everything needs to remain on the dining deck, not encroach on the sidewalk. Um, and I, I would like to talk a little bit more about uh, having the wood option, because for me, that just opens up uh, um, I, I think areas that could be problematic for us unless we really get into a lot of detail about, uh, you know, the kind of, of a wood or the kind of, you know, artificial wood that's going to be used and, uh, you know, how that's going to look. We all know that um, people build fences in town and sometimes the fences look great and sometimes they don't look so great depending on the kind of wood that they're made out of. And so um, I, I would like to see us start as, as Courtney suggested with just the concrete planners. It's simple, it's easy, it's neat. Um, uh, we know what it's going to be when it goes in. And um, while I usually agree with Mr. Newman, um, I think that if you go to Las Gladys, you'll find that that's a very eclectic city. The buildings are all quite different, but they have been consistent in their uh, how they've handled their outdoor dining. And it looks really nice there. And I would like to see that happen in Capitola as well. So those are my comments. Thank you, Susan. Well, I've flip-flopped, I think, three times just listening to these comments. Um, uh, I, uh, Mr. Arnault completely convinced me that uh, we're walking down a path of uh, a committee designing a horse and ending up with a camel. But then Courtney convinced me that, no, this is a streetscape. And Mick says, this is, uh, we need some consistency in a streetscape. Mm -hmm. um, so it's difficult for me to... Uh, to decide on something. I know um, I've looked at the Reef Dog um, outdoor dining and that's beautiful and that, that's got wooden wooden planters and I, I, it doesn't worry me that, uh, that that's a safety issue. Um, but ultimately, if I was to weigh in, I would say that the one thing that I would agree since we, we seem to have a consensus on the concrete planters 
that I, that I could go along with the consistency being the concrete planners. And then everything beyond that, it's like, I give up. I can't design these things for them. The plants, the, the heaters, the, let them do it, do what they want. But, but the concrete planners, maybe that's the consistency that looks, uh, that makes us look at least professional. And those are my comments. Uh, any further comments? Um, Katie, did you get the input you needed? Um, I, I kind of want to get some clarity. So I think I hear a majority saying concrete only. Um, I'm hearing four out of five. Um, pyramid heaters. I'm just going to go down my list, if you don't mind. So um, for the pyramid heaters, can you raise your hand if you want them all to be pyramid heaters? Okay, so I think we were, and can you raise your hand if you would rather them all be the standard heater? Or is there a, how about, a, it, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, <laughs> as long as they provide heat. We have three for it doesn't matter, or three? Okay, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so no reg. Um, narrow the type of plants to create a streetscape. So right now we have about 20 plus. Um, Jennifer was saying we can do some, uh, we can bring it, uh, shorten the list. So there's some shade plants and some sun plants. Can I see a raise of hands for those who support narrowing the scope of plant options? Oh so man, it's up to me. <laughs> Two out of five. You brought it up. I know it, but he changed my mind. I, I just, Go ahead. You do this. I, Courtney, you be sir, I'm not, I have preferences. I just, in plants and in everything, I just really feel that it just needs to, like, the underlying theme should be, it should just be fresh and nice. I don't care if, you know, if there's no, narrowing would be great. It just, make it look good. <laughs> Why are you just going down to 10 options? That's a maybe. <laughs> Is 10 yeah. a good place to land? <laughs> Do I hear 12? I, I, I guess, I, I, guess I, I don't think it's a good idea to limit it because I think now all of a sudden that we're, we're going to have to pick the plants and I don't think we're capable as a committee to be arborists. Oh, or well, we have wonderful... So, um, Landscape architects on our team. Who can, who, they, Mike, Mike and Jennifer can pick the plants, but if you'd like them to further limit them, please raise your hand. Further limiting? Okay. Okay. So we'll further limit. I'm seeing uh, three out of five. Street furniture. Um, would you like to require that they utilize one of the three manufacturers? They can pick their colors, they can pick their style, but they should utilize one of the three manufacturers. I'm seeing hands 100% support there. Courtney, do you wanna comment? I, um, no, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna go there. <laughs> okay. Um, we do have conditions that if they get faded, they need to be replaced, but those um, manufacturers were picked because of their quality and, and better pricing. Um, so concrete is a yes. Um, signage, requiring signs to face the sidewalk side of the dining deck, is there support for that condition? Rather than it won't, they won't, the signs cannot face out to the street, they need to face towards the sidewalk. Okay, that's support. Are, are flags and banners included in that or would that fall into the sign ordinance? Um, they're not allowed to have a flag or a banner on the outdoor dining, just okay. two, two square feet signs. One can be a menu sign and the other one can say the name of the business. Um, stanchions um, require that they be on the dining deck and not allowed to go into the sidewalk. Okay. Um, I have a note here, and I think, Mick, you brought this up, the public bike parking. It was one of your first comments, but I'm not sure exactly. I'm wondering if uh, on the prototype designs where they include the, the bikes, if that's public. Oh, yes, and I'll add a condition. That's a great point. 
um, that those are to be open to the public. It's not just for those people. Um, so, okay. Okay, do you want me to review the list or? Um, I'm good with Close to 10 happy with, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy with what you've read back. Okay, great. So with that, I am looking for a motion to approve. It's a blanket coastal development permit as well as a design permit for the prototype design with the added conditions as we just reviewed. So move. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. Roll call vote. Louis, you're on mute. Commissioner yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kristen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Yes. Commissioner Westman? Yes. Commissioner Rook? Aye. Joe Wick? Aye. Okay. So much for a short meeting. Let's move on to our second item, <laughs> which is uh, 201 Monterey Avenue, number C. Do we have a staff presentation? Hey, good evening, commissioners, and thank you, Chair Wilk. A brief presentation on uh, this item. So uh, this is Castagnola's Cafe and Deli and 201 Monterey Avenue, the corner of Capitola Avenue in Monterey, uh, in a historic building, the Hine Superintendent Building, and uh, zoning is mixed use village. So a little relevant uh, permit background here. In 2007, uh, a prior owner came to the city for a CUP modification. Uh, they combined two units, which is the 550 square foot Castagnola Deli uh, as it is today. And uh, they were approved for a takeout deli with six inside seats. And then in 2020 as a COVID-19 relief measure, a temporary use permit was, was approved to allow sidewalk seating and uh, use of the side patio. And uh, essentially with the addition of beer and wine, that is what is being proposed tonight. Uh, to be formally approved with uh, the new ordinance allowing outdoor dining. So beer and wine sales, uh, and then an update to the hours to comply. Uh, there were some old conditions with the prior use permit. And so we're just uh, recommending that the hours get modified to, to match the, uh, the outdoor dining ordinance. Uh, some of our analysis, we, we uh, had a plan check with public works and we also had a meeting with the police department uh, public works primary interest was uh, clearance of the sidewalk and we checked with police because there's a, a requirement in the outdoor dining ordinance that uh, the establishment be in good standing so we wanted to see if there were any service calls and there were not uh, one concern did come out of my contact with abc and that was just clearance on the sidewalk uh, and i have a couple of slides to show that uh, and it's primarily about clearance and delineation um, and so the applicant did propose to uh, have beer and wine consumption on the sidewalk. Uh, that's really the only, only item with this application that we couldn't support. Uh, and so these are the, the conditions. The other is um, current ordinance allows, and this came up on the last item, 160 square feet of customer accessible space. Uh, this with the combination of these two units is 220 square feet or thereabouts. Uh, so they just need to remain with their six seats as a, approved with the prior use permit and we talked to the owner about replacing the umbrellas which they agreed to got a site plan uh, so the two areas for outdoor dining uh, three two by two bistro style uh, wrought iron along the base of the building at the sidewalk and then it's uh, 88 square feet it's 11 by 8 at the patio dining and then uh, proposed beer and wine fridge behind the uh, the counter. This is the side patio seating. And then this is the customer area. So proposal is to bring in another commercial display refrigerator for the beer and wine. And then this gets into some of the constraints uh, that relate to both sidewalk clearance and then 
ABC's concern about delineation. So uh, this is actually the wider side. The sidewalk has a bit of a taper as it relates to the building here. And so edge of table to the five foot clearance is 27 inches and uh, only 13 inches to the back of a chair. So any kind of planter or stanchion is just is rendering the space just not uh, not able to to have enough maneuverability to fully delineate as ABC would require. This is a view of the other side. Uh, we did actually add a condition of approval. This is the north side, this table nearest the photo. And uh, this, this can only really be a two top with two opposing chairs that are uh, parallel to the building. A third chair doesn't really work here with the sidewalk clearance and it's a really busy sidewalk. So with that, uh, we are recommending approval just with the limitation of no consumption of beer and wine at the sidewalk. And I can take questions. Questions to staff. Yeah, I have one. Uh, Commissioner Ruth. Brian, did you raise the issue with them of their illegal sign they often post on the corner at Monterey and Capitola Avenue? No, we, we didn't talk about that. I think that sign actually is a uh, approve it may just be the placement if they're putting it closer to the corner that is a that meets the sidewalk I, I found an old permit for a sidewalk sign so is it it's typically it's placed down on the corner okay when we were there it was uh it was right at the edge of the of the building in the next door space okay. but we were we were there pretty early in the morning Is that it? Yeah, just maybe they need a reminder. Yep. Okay. Commissioner Westman? Uh, I'm fine with this one. Okay, your hand was up. Oh, um, sorry, I gotta put my hand down. I'm down. Yeah, I have a, a comment. I, I, brought it, uh, I brought it up to staff uh, beforehand, Ruth, regarding uh, a rest restroom capability since they're hitting since they have more and more uh, diners there's a restroom that's that's shown inside the inside the building could we just make sure that that's not a uh, employees only restroom that that is a public restroom is that something we can do in uh, like uh, conditions or somehow ensure that that's the case yeah we, we could add a condition that there be a uh, a restroom available to the public. I think as it stands right now, they're because of the combination of the two tenant spaces, each of them had an, a bathroom. So I think the way they're utilizing it now is one is public facing and one is employee facing. Okay, I just want to make sure that there is there is one public public facing or public um, public access restroom. Uh, that's okay. So those are the questions. Are there any? Um, uh, public comments on this issue. Does, does the applicant wish to speak? I did see uh, Commissioner Christensen's hand was up as well. There might be one additional question. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a question there, uh, Katie? I mean, Courtney? Yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted a quick clarification of what um, the 160 square feet limitation was in, with, um, you mentioned it before. Yeah, it, it's just a, a, there was a change in the newly adopted zoning ordinance for takeout restaurants. Uh, so the prior standard was a maximum of six seats. Mm -hmm. And the current standard is a maximum of square footage uh, capped at 160 square feet accessible to customers. So just a sort of a, a minor change, no longer counting seats, just limiting square footage. Okay, so how does that affect his interior space in terms it, of? It really doesn't. It's just a point of clarification that um, they're complying with their prior use permit in that regard, and they they have too much space to comply currently. So we need to still limit them to six seats. I see. Okay. Okay. Any other questions of staff? Let's go then to public comments. Do we have public comments? 
I'm looking at the Zoom attendees and I'm currently not seeing any hands up. And I'm going to ask uh, Planner Sasanto if he can check the email. We do not have any emails in. Okay, very good. Let's move on then to uh, deliberations. Does anybody uh, wish to discuss this matter or make a motion? I would like to make a motion to approve his request for beer and wine. I think there's not a problem. I like the motion. <laughs> So we have a motion to approve uh, this this uh, application with staff comments. I as I assume, as well as a second. Any any additional comments or deliberations? Are we adding the condition that was uh, proposed regarding the restroom? I, I don't feel that that's necessary, but okay. I am open to input. <laughs> Uh, then let me add that as a friendly amendment. Can we? Can I add that as a friendly amendment to insist that there is a public restroom available? Will you accept that amendment, Courtney? Yeah. Okay. We can will. I, uh, will you also accept that, Mick, as your as the seconder? Yes. Okay. Susan Westman has a question. So when you say public, this is not anyone from the street can walk over and use it. This is a restroom for their customers. That's my intent. Okay. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Can we have a roll call vote, Louis? Yes. Commissioner Christensen? Yes. Commissioner Newman? Yes. Commissioner Westman? Yes. Commissioner Ruth? Yes. Joe Wick? Aye. Motion passes. Let's move now on to item 5B. No, C. We're up to 1350 49th Avenue. We have a staff presentation. Yes, thank you. Just one moment. Let's see. Good evening, commissioners. So the uh, application before you is for 1350 49th Avenue. This is a permit amendment for a design permit coastal development permit and a variance request for a single family residence at, uh, again, 1350 49th Avenue. Project is located in the Jewel Box neighborhood at the intersection of Topaz Street and 49th Avenue. Uh, this amendment does not alter the nature of the, the variance request uh, that was previously granted in 2018. And the project is of comparable scope. So I'm going to be kind of brief with the the project overview and can take any commission questions at the end. This is the proposed site plan. And as before, I'm highlighting some of the, the additions this on the, on the uh, slide, you can see the blue areas, which are the first story additions, a garage and a bathroom. Again here, except for the second story, this is the extent of the second story addition, which is entirely new. It amounts to approximately 446 square feet. With the first and second story additions in total, the proposed project is 1,832 square feet, uh, or for a floor area ratio of 57%, conforming to the maximum floor area ratio of 57% for the lot. And here I'm gonna go through side by side the previously approved designs and the currently proposed designs. So this is the, the west facing elevation uh, or the most uh, publicly visible and uh, front facing elevation along 49th Avenue. Changes in massing are perhaps most noticeable on this elevation with an expanded porch in the center and a wider second story. 
Exterior material changes have also uh, taken place uh, and include stucco siding instead of vertical, uh, instead of horizontal, excuse me, wood boards and standing metal seam roof instead of composition shingle. Here are the north side elevations approved and proposed. This is the east side. And this is the rear elevation. So the variance uh, included with this application is is the same as before. It is for the construction of the, the single story garage to extend 13 inches into the north side setback. This would allow them to build a, a full uh, development standard 10 by 20 parking space. And covered parking is a requirement for the scale of this project. This is the same placement as the original design as well. So in reviewing the application uh, as before for applicability for variance, um, I wanted to go over a little bit about just the site. As you can see here, we have an approximation of the first story building envelope with respect to setbacks. It's highly irregular based on the irregular lot dimensions and shape. Um, it has a Four, it's a four-sided polygon with no parallel or congruent sides. Typical lots in the jewel box neighborhood are typically rectangular in shape and approximately 40 by 80 feet. On this lot, uh, the frontage is 60 feet wide. Uh, the lot lines are 30 deep on the south and 71 on, uh, deep on the north uh, with the rear lot line of 74 feet. Uh, the unique lot shape provides an atypical area in which to locate a rectangular garage. Uh, most properties in the vicinity and zone in which the property is located are able to accommodate the required 10 by 20 foot covered parking space due to the fact that they are regularly shaped and, and oriented. Granting a variance uh, will allow the applicant to enjoy the same privileges as those properties around it within the same neighborhood and zone and would allow this property to be closer to conformance with its requirements for parking. Based on these findings, uh, staff continues to support the variance request. And then I was going to touch on the nonconformities. Uh, the existing home is, uh, as you can tell, non a nonconforming structure because it does not conform to the front, side, or rear setback requirements. The red area is the existing uh, footprint of the structure. Um, it also extends beyond the south lot line into the adjacent lot. The proposed project was reviewed by the building official and does not exceed the 80%, although it is uh, pretty close to that 80% threshold as uh, the, one of the commissioners had noted to us earlier um, of the present fair market value. So the proposed additions are admissible underneath the, the construction cost calculation for non-conforming structures. And with that, we are recommending to the Planning Commission that they approve the permit amendment based on the findings and conditions of approval. Like I said before, I can cover anything that we didn't touch on if the Commission has any questions. Any questions of staff? Uh, Commissioner Ruth. Yeah, I, I just like some clarification on the, calling it an amended permit. If, if the original permit was granted in 2018 uh -huh. and they never acted on that permit, didn't that permit expire? I'm sure if that's a great question, they actually have in under our understanding acted on this application, given that they have an active building permit that has been under review. Um, this came about through proposed modifications to that building permit whereupon after seeing the latest uh, proposed revisions, we notified the applicant that these well exceeded the scope of which we could do under administrative modification. And we let them know that if they wanted to proceed, it would have to go back to the planning commission. Okay. It just strikes me, this should be an entirely new application because uh, they haven't done any work that I'm aware of. Uh, 
Second, I, I, I like some clarification on the encroachment onto the adjacent lot. Is that an encroachment that's put into the title? Are, are you asking if it is on the title or if we are requiring it be on the title? Well, I, I guess the I answer guess to either of those would be no. Where, where does the adjacent property owner come into play in this? So I actually do have a slide for that. Uh, give me one moment. So this is the south uh, boundary. Uh, to the south, it is 1335 Prospect Avenue. And I've highlighted two areas, the area shaded in blue. Uh, actually, both those areas, blue and in red, are currently encroaching sections of the existing structure. The red area is being proposed for removal. The blue area is uh, not, and the walls there are being proposed for improvements, um, structural improvements, as well as fireproofing. We have spoken be, uh, before this with both the property owner, the applicant, who I believe both of which are present, as well as uh, the, the property owner of the said property to the south, as well as the city attorney about this encroachment and the best way to handle it. Um, from our understanding, the, the neighboring properties, biggest concern is not allowing a, a perpetuous uh, access to their property. Um, so after speaking with our attorney, um, we added a condition that would require an access agreement between the two parties for the purposes of construction. Uh, that doesn't extend into uh, any kind of uh, change to title or, or easement. So is this an irrevocable encroachment permit? No, there's, there's uh, nothing that to that nature. This is all on private property and the extent of this encroachment is existing. We, we're not authorizing if, any new encroachments. Okay, what if the property that's encroached upon changes hands and the new owner doesn't want this neighbor encroaching on his property? That would be a private property matter. Uh, that's my understanding. This is, this is a long-standing encroachment to which um, both owners are well aware of because these properties have been in the hands of, um, up until recently, the same families for decades. In fact, I, I did come across uh, discussion of this very encroachment from decades past in a, in a prior public hearing here. So it's, it's well established that it's there. If, if the encroached uh, property wishes to remediate that, they would likely need to seek counsel. Okay, yeah, I'm just familiar with a situation where there was an encroachment for probably over 50 years on uh, another property. And when that property sold, the new owner made that encroachment go away. Yeah, so Commissioner Ruth, just to clarify, um, the, the requirement that we will have on this permit is that they allow access during construction, but it's right. not to go any further beyond that. That will be a private property matter, but okay. to allow them access during construction. Yeah. It seems like it's a gamble for the builder on that, on that home because if the property next door to him ever changes hands, that new property owner could make him move that portion of his house off his property. So, so this is Commissioner Westman. And we had these come up a number of times in Capitola because there are a lot of encroachments. And typically they just did a lot line adjustment as part of the application so that you cleaned up this encroachment. Um, were they approached about doing a lot line adjustment? Not specifically, not by the city, no. Uh, has you know, I'm old and the rules change a lot and they may have changed since I was around, but I thought you were required under state subdivision law to do a lot line adjustment in these kinds of situations. Um, in reviewing this with our city attorney, they did not raise that concern, but we could still have that conversation with the applicant should they want to pursue a lot line adjustment. Yeah, because I, 
I, I don't think it's appropriate for us to allow somebody to rebuild something on someone else's property without, you know, certainly having legal documents that say it's okay with that other property owner. That is, a that is the requirement within this permit is that they are allowing them to do that. Well, let, let me get a clarification on that then because the, you got the 78% versus 80% calculation. If it was 80%, then it would come before us to reevaluate this encroachment. Is But since it's less than 80%, we don't get a say. Is that is that how you interpret that? So, if I'm understanding you correctly, um, I think the answer would be if they were over eighty percent on their non-conforming calculation, the question at hand would be um, either to require conformance to all standards, including setbacks or to request a variance for the nonconformities at, at large, not just new nonconformities, but existing ones. So, so to follow up on that, when, when, when you did this calculation, the 78%, that was the city official who made that conversation, that cut calculation, or that was the applicant who then submitted it for review? It starts by the applicant submitting the, the formula that we have to us, and then we take a look at it based okay. on their, on their okay. scope. Okay, so that in 2018 was the same calculation made and maybe it was 40% or 20% or? That, yes, the same calculation and, and, and method was used. Um, I don't actually have a record of the original uh, spreadsheet that was utilized then, but it was the same process that, and despite the fact that our code has updated the non-conforming section of our code has not. So it was the same process. All right. It just seems to me that it is possible that if someone, an independent person made that calculation, they could come up with 80, 81%. And then, then they'd have to come up to us with a variance in which case all these issues would come up again in, in earnest. But OK, uh, Mr. Newman, you have a uh, your hand up. Well, uh, this discussion has really uh, I need some clarification. Are they getting a permit to actually build on the neighbor's property? Is that the, the uh, result of this, if we approve this? This would conditionally allow them to it, uh, improve yeah. some of the existing encroachments. It, yeah, it would not I, I be expansions. I I don't know what uh, the city attorney addressed in this regard, but I, I it, it seems inconceivable to me that we can grant a permit to the owner of property to build on somebody else's property, or rebuild, or do anything else. I uh, agree. And I agree. Also, I think the solution to it is just to make because I don't. I mean, I don't want to see them not be able to do their project, but I think. It, it should be the way we normally handle these is with an encroachment agreement. And I think that should be a condition. Approve, approved by the uh, city. You have okay. um, the, just so you know, the architect John Hoffaker is present on the Zoom call and maybe can provide some clarity of what exactly is happening on the neighboring property with the plans. Okay. If you'd like. Yeah, let's go ahead and hear from him then. Okay, I'm going to, uh, uh, Mr. Hoffaker, you're available. You can speak now. Oh, hi, this is John. Uh, I always have to start with saying I'm a lowly architect. I, I'm not an attorney, so I don't have uh, land use comments on this, but uh, they have an active building permit that was approved and they could continue building um, um, what they have approved for. And um, so, 
which would include improvements to the uh, things that encroach. Uh, second is that I think they did try to make some effort to remove some of the encroachment, add fireproofing to it, and make it less encroaching than it was just in terms of an architectural structural fire uh, aspect. Um, that's really all that the architect can weigh in on. Um, and uh, so um, I could hand it back to it. Maybe Rick Aberly knows more. He's been the one who's been in discussions with Tom, his next door neighbor. And I live right across the street, um, but I haven't been privy to the conversations between Rick Aberly and Tom. So I'll hand it back to you right now. Okay, thank you, John. Um, uh, Courtney, you have your hand up. I, th I think that was my overreaching question, um, listening to the discussion before was, if we were just to say, you know, we don't want you to modify your existing building permit, can they just go ahead since they've already had an, a, an approved um, building permit to, with the variance and with all of, you know, the conditions from the previous approval. So if we, if I mean, are, is staff asking us basically to approve the alterations to the existing with, I mean, the variance has already been approved to, to encroach without any agreement. Is that, is, that's kind of my question. Is that, is that what I'm hearing? Staff? My understanding is that in the initial, and Sean, please um, correct me if I'm wrong, but the initial approval did not include an encroachment agreement. And for, for this, so yes, they do have an active building permit in place that they can act on under the old um, approval. Um, although I, I don't know that it's been, it, it's been in process, but as Sean said, they tried to modify some pages and that's how this came up was um, not allowing the modification. So the planning commission can definitely um, act on the plan in front of them tonight and add requirements in order to do the work in that area that encroaches over the property line. However, we did meet with the city attorney on this and had them review, um, and they thought that just requiring an access agreement approved by the neighbor in order to do work in that area um, should be the requirement on this permit. So I'm a little bit hesitant to add a requirement for an encroachment permit, um, but maybe we could, if you wanna do that in the language, suggest um, that, at, you know, as reviewed and approved by the, you know, in language approved by the city attorney, I think that would be um, a way in which to resolve this, one, that, that issue. I, th I think my question, um, is if we deny their alterations to their existing permit, if we just say we don't really want your existing permit, can they still move ahead with their variance that they had approved before? Is that? I believe so. I believe they've been acting on their building permit and keeping it active. So Sean, do you have any insight on that? Uh, yeah, you're, you're correct there. They've, they've maintained this uh, application uh, and, and to your specific question about the variance uh, there, this exact variance was approved. It's on the opposite side of the structure. Um, the, the proposed garage is actually on the north side and this encroachment is on the south side. So they, they don't directly uh, relate to each other. Sean, what have they done to keep the permit active? They've continued to submit plans and respond to comments. Um, it's, it's been a, effectively on hold uh, since this was applied for, and I believe January. But that was three years it passed, almost four years. I believe there's a bit of a hiatus during uh, a portion of COVID. I don't have the exact uh, 
submittal and response uh, records in front of me, but um, our, our building official has, has kept this active. So um, this is Commissioner Westman. I, I actually have no problem with the modifications that they want to make, but for me personally, I, I don't think I'm going to be comfortable voting for it unless we have something, you know, from our city attorney, which says it's perfectly okay for us to approve them building on someone else's property. So okay, I'm wondering me... if it makes some sense just to continue this to our next meeting, because if the attorneys come back and say, you guys are making a big fuss over nothing, you don't need to worry about it, then, you know, I'm ready to go full speed ahead approving their modifications, but I'm not comfortable doing it without having that assurance. Okay, I, I think I've let the meeting get out of, uh, out of sequence here a little bit. We're supposed to be still in the questioning phase okay. uh, and we haven't even heard from the applicant or the public yet. So maybe we should move ahead and, and ask if there are any Zoom comments or hands raised from the public on this topic. We, we, did, we did hear from the architect. Well, we we, we asked there... specifically, we asked from the architect, but we didn't open up for public comment. Okay, I'm fine with doing the process correctly. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I, I, I do have two hands up. One is uh, John Hofker is the applicant. I, we had some specific questions there for him. I'm not sure if he wants to uh, add on to that or not. I, I do think it would be great to hear from John Hofficker exactly what's happening in that area of the encroachment. I, I don't think that was answered. I think he did answer that. While we get him here, uh, also on the plan, I couldn't tell whether there's a second story deck over the garage. So maybe maybe someone could answer that. There is not, but I uh, I think I can let John uh, speak to the some of these elements himself. He, John, you still are authorized to speak right now, if you'd like to. above the garage and it's just a flat area um, and and you'll have to speak up it's hard to hear you okay i'm getting closer the area above the garage is just a flat area um, and just to keep a lower roof line uh, to the north property and it's not more than four feet above the, so it provides a less than four foot interior space. Um, so that's the only thing happening. There's no walkable deck area. There's no access to that area. Um, so it's not something that could even be adapted to a second floor deck. The, the south area with the encroachment, uh, the previous plan was mostly leaving the area alone. Um, and the project was, a, the whole project was a little bit less in scope so that um, the percentage of construction was less. If the percentage of construction goes too high, then the building is such an odd shape that the setbacks are so, uh, uh, intrusive that you come up with almost no building area. Uh, specifically, the area that does encroach on the south property line, uh, there was a about a two foot by eight foot little attachment area. It really wasn't part of the, we didn't know what it was for. Somehow it was attached, so we were removing it. So about two foot by eight foot is being removed from it. That's one thing. And then the owner wanted to do, instead of wood siding, he wanted to do stucco siding, which would provide a uh, more of a fireproof uh, or a non-combustible aspect 
of the walls. And then any overhang that, there's about a one foot overhang now, and that overhang is being taken away. So it's less wood for uh, more fire protection. And there's just a gutter, a fascia gutter put on that captures the water and is directed onto our property and not uh, directed onto uh, the south property. So this whole thing was just trying to improve the situation more than it is uh, now. Um, so we thought we were trying to make it better. And I think the property owner has done demolition. Uh, they have been working with PG&E about the improvements. Uh, and I believe that was enough to keep the, but I'm not involved in construction. The architect doesn't have controlled means and methods of per permit or construction. Um, I believe that's what kept the permit active plus delays with COVID. Uh, 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 but I'm not specifically knowledgeable about that. It might be good to hear from Rick Aberly if he uh, wants to comment about the uh, discussions with Tom. Or, but this has been a long standing condition and I appreciate everybody's concern. Uh, and we're actually trying to make it better. Um, uh, so I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. So I see, uh, okay, I see uh, Rick has raised his hand. Rick, I've uh, just unmuted you there. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so um, my discussions with Tom, once we were told that we need to get approval from Tom to go and do any work off that side of the house, was he, he had no problem with it. When I got this house like 11 years ago, um, Tom, I met Tom then, and, and he said, hey, if you're ever going to do anything on the side of the house, make sure you let me know, because this is all my property. And I said, yeah, no problem. So that's kind of the relationship we really have. Obviously, we haven't done nothing in 11 years. It's the same siding, same everything over there. But um, so far, Tom said, no problem. And I gave him a letter, and he said, yeah, I'll, I'll sign this and have this so you can do your work. That's really all that, that I got out of that so far. Okay, thank you, Rick. Thank you. Anyone else? We do have a Stephen Lang uh, with his hand raised. So. Go ahead, Stephen. Stephen, you've been unmuted if you'd like to speak now. So I can't hear him. Can anyone else? I see his, his mic was just uh, enabled. Stephen, we can't hear you. Um. Well, um, since Stephen is gone mute, uh, is there anybody else with their hand up? Uh, I, I don't see anyone else with their hand up. We did receive a comment uh, via email um, from, I can just read that. It's very, very brief. Uh, Joan Alter. Why are you allowing a non-conforming to continue uh, a Topaz neighbor? Okay. Uh, 
let's just let Stephen know that if he wants to text us or anything, we we can go ahead and, and try to get his comment in. But in the meantime, maybe we should then move on to um, commission deliberations. So do we want to go back to uh, general comments about the project in general? Commissioners. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. I don't have any problem with the project in general. Uh, I certainly question the validity of the original permit to make it an admitted permit, but that's neither here nor there. But I'm with Susan. I don't see how we can approve a plan that encroaches on someone else's property when an, the only document is just a letter from Tom Deasy to this gentleman saying it's okay. Uh, I think we need to go with Susan's original uh, suggestion of a lot line adjustment to make everything legal and continue it until that takes place. Well, so Susan's last comment was uh, we should get a, a, we should have legal uh, review this one more time and then continue it until we get um, uh, something more, firm, uh, more, more affirmative or serious from legal, whatever I wanna say. So uh, do we wanna just go ahead and, and support a motion for continuance? Chair Wilk, there's one thing I'd like to just note, and Katie, you can, you can correct me if I'm, uh, if there's anything more here. But uh, with regards to the condition number 23 that we had added, uh, some context was that when we spoke with our city attorney, they had they had uh, offered to draft a access agreement for for us and and the the parties involved. So that would be something directly crafted by them. Right. This is Commissioner Westman. I mean, for me personally, I can't vote for approving a project that encroaches onto someone else's property. If you come back and the city attorney writes us a letter and says, you know, there is no problem with the planning commission approving projects that encroach on other people's property, I'll happily vote for it because I don't have any uh, particular problems with what they're, you know, proposing to do or the modifications that they want to make. I'm just uncomfortable voting um, to do this on, on another person's property. And, you know, I may be off base and the city attorney may tell me that, but until they give me something that tells me that, uh, you know, I, I would have to vote against it and I would really not you know, like to be in a position where I have to vote against it. Okay, let me just so weigh I, in as well and say that that's really my only issue as well. And that I, uh, I'm i very happy with all of the other aspects of the property and the project, even the variance on the, with, the, with the garage. I have no problems with anything other than what's been discussed here, which is the approval of building on other, someone else's property. Does anybody else have any comments about the project in general, uh, Commissioners uh, Christensen or or Newman? Did, Feedback would we want to give him as a as a as a builder? Well, this is Commissioner Newman. I I agree that the project. I have no issues with the project, and I focused initially on this same issue of uh, building on someone else's property. But I don't. I think a lot line adjustment is a, is kind of a long way around the problem. And he, he's already doing what I assume is a recorded access agreement to go on to the other property uh, while he's going to be doing this building. And I think that that could be expanded to include um, an allowance of the encroachment. Normally what those kinds of agreements say is that the existing encroachment can remain or in this case can even be improved uh, as long as it's still there. And then if it ever burns down or is some how demolished then the uh, original property line remains the uh, valid and that gets recorded. And I think we'd be doing them a favor if they clean this up now, because these kinds of things come back when maybe there are other owners and uh, they can be very ugly and expensive. Uh, so I think just letting this uh, go forward without um, helping them in effect, uh, uh, rectify this is a mistake. 
but I don't think we need to force them into a lot line adjustment. So okay. well, I, I, I would be willing to make a motion to continue this application to our next meeting uh, to give staff time to get a written response from the city attorney for the planning commission regarding the encroachment on the neighbor's property. Second. Uh, is there a second? Okay. I'll second. Well, uh, I have a, a, a motion and a second by Commissioner Ruth. Uh, Courtney uh, Christensen, you had a comment or or as far as further discussion goes, do you have any anything no, I, you wish to say? I was just going to, I was seconding um, Commissioner Westman's um, motion, but then Commissioner Ruth beat me to it. <laughs> oh, but quick, but quick let, let me just ask, let me just further ask, since uh, since since we're here reviewing the project, and we've been focusing on this one issue. Are there any other issues that any of the commissioners want to bring up as something that need to be addressed? Or is everybody pretty much like I am and like Commissioner Ruth is very happy with the project with that one exception? I'm fine with the project, Commissioner I'm Newman. I'm fine with the project. Yeah. Okay, very good. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, Louie, could we have a... Roll call vote. Yes, please. Commissioner Christensen? Aye. Commissioner Newman? Yes. Commissioner Westman? Yes. Commissioner Ruth? Aye. Aye. Uh, continuance passes, <coughs> and hopefully we'll get a uh, uh, a, a good legal uh, adjustment on this uh, in the next meeting and, and, and let the app go ahead with this project. So now we're ready to move on to our last uh, public item, which is 720 Hill Street. Do we have a staff presentation? Yes, thank you, Chair Wilk. <clears throat> so 720 Hill Street, uh, tonight before the commission is a new hotel. Uh, the permits being requested, design review, conditional use permit, and a tree removal. Uh, property is a little over three acres and has the quality in uh, developed on it currently. And uh, the point to the, the green spot on the map here, there's actually an undeveloped field here uh, at the remainder of the property that is for this new hotel. Uh, this would be a boutique hotel and uh, would not be associated with the Quality Inn. This is just a street view of that site. Uh, never been developed, uh, only has just a minimal perimeter landscaping. So a uh, little bit of background. Uh, the original hotel was approved and only built in one phase. There actually was another phase of the hotel uh, in 1978 that was approved in the, on this uh, sub-site of the, the larger property, never built, and uh, similar efforts in 1989 through 2005. Uh, some various, there was even a, a sub residential subdivision approved here, but uh, nothing has ever actually moved forward to break ground. The commission and the city council uh, saw this last year, uh, basically in the same size and scope of, of project, but uh, some significant refinements have been made. Uh, the general layout and uh, some quantifiable measurables here. So the property takes ac access off of Crossroads Loop. Uh, the arrows on the left side here are showing uh, how a vehicle or a guest uh, arriving for check-in would arrive at the property. Uh, and then the green is the hotel. Uh, underneath the hotel on the, the bottom floor is, a, is the public space, and uh, you drive through the, the upper floor, the upper two floors are the guest floors, and those strut out over the, uh, the Portica Share arrival. Uh, so after check-in, you would proceed to the private drive, and then up you know, the second set of arrows is uh, the proposed parking. Building size is a little over 18,000 square feet, 42 rooms, and... Uh, We've got three loading spaces and the proposing 15 bike parking spaces. 
Uh, the city contracted with RM architecture and planning uh, consultant, uh, continued that uh, contract. They, they reviewed the conceptual review. We continued it uh, with this formal review. And uh, some of the design enhancements are highlighted here. Uh, we've got a new material and cladding at the soffit, a massing break uh, where the Trespa panel and the stucco, uh, as they wrap around and meet, there's a, a vertical articulation there. A stair tower was moved. That was a topic of uh, concern for the um, daylight plane. So that was moved over significantly. And then um, the column that's uh, strutting out over the Port Gachere uh, has a new design feature. There's an added laser cut metal around the arrival and then uh, further enhancing the arrival experience is a stained concrete pattern. Flipping around uh, the, the property, uh, the way this design is, is it's, it's cut into the hill. So on the upside uh, at the new parking area, you're looking at only a two story. Uh, they've added some, a third accent color at the facade, uh, continuing that uh, laser cut uh, material at the stair. And that stair goes up to a, a rooftop patio, uh, which is a key amenity for this property and an angled awning for after uh, guests have checked in and they're going into their room. And then this is a view from the Hill Street side. You can see the cut into the hill there. And then flipping around, this is from the private drive and there's that rooftop patio. It's got a, uh, a penthouse that would serve uh, catering and then uh, proposed along the corner here uh, as the building turns is a mural. And uh, this may qualify for, uh, this project is required to provide public art uh, but the goal here is to uh, hire a, an artist to um, in, to paint on or install uh, some kind of a public art, and it may meet that requirement. It may not, but it's going to be incorporated into this design in either case. Looking at uh, floor plans, so on the left we've got the public space. Um, this is a, a limited service property, so it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty efficient in the layout. Um, I'm going to use the pointer here. Got the front door, lobby check-in, office space. There's an in-house laundry, lounge, a meeting room, and a fitness. And then the guest floors stack. Uh, so they're primarily the same. And they split between five kings and 16 queens. And that's on the right side here. This is the rooftop patio floor plan. So it's uh, wrapped on the north and west side with a built-in rooftop planner. Uh, it's got a shade structure and you can see the, the back bar or uh, catering bar there. Uh, three different means of ingress, egress, got the elevator and then uh, two stairways that access this. Um, just a quick highlight on drainage because uh, this is a, a pretty substantial drainage installation. Um, so there's two detention basins in the, the orange and then a riprap lined swale. So all of this is designed uh, based on a calculation of a 95th percentile storm event over a one hour duration uh, in order to recharge and give water an opportunity to be treated on site. Uh, with regard to landscaping, uh, this, this plan has been pretty substantially enhanced in terms of quantity and size of plants uh, with a big focus on the residential boundary, which I've circled here. Uh, there is one limitation uh, with a wall along the, the boundary, along the right side of this plan. Uh, there's a, a CMU wall, concrete wall, um, block wall, that is uh, varies like from four to six feet onto the hotel side of the property and does present some limitations. And I'm um, gonna get into that in a little more detail here. So the proposal is a seven foot tall trellis uh, with a growing vine. Um, my my uh, superimposed here is not to scale, but it, it's representative of, of the intent. Uh, and this is to project two feet above the existing wall that you can see in the photo there. 
And then uh, as mentioned at the top of the meeting, we did get some uh, correspondence after the packet was, was issued. And so there is a neighbor concern about this, uh, the same issue. Uh, so they've written an email uh, that we forwarded on requesting either a new wall or adding a cap to the wall or somehow increasing the wall height to so, uh, add to privacy and noise impacts. Uh, there was a concern mentioned about large vehicles and idling vehicles and noise and uh, parking lot lighting was also mentioned. Uh, I'm going to circle back to that, but I'm just going to kind of finish on the to the aspects of the, the project first. So some sustainability features, uh, we've got four EV chargers, rooftop solar panels, a number of uh, water use efficiency uh, items that will be uh, built into the, the project. And then um, a program to, to do loaner bikes. Six loaner bikes are, are proposed. Uh, with regard to CEQA, the city contracted with DUDEC for, to be our lead consultant. Uh, they advised that uh, this project qualified as a infill categorical exemption, uh, but they did do two focus studies, which were uh, included as attachments in a transportation study and an arch archeological assessment. Um, the site does have a, a zoning overlay, so an affordable housing overlay. And uh, with the last housing element cycle was assigned 61 units. And so in the staff report, we did some analysis. We worked with the city attorney as well. Uh, and we were able to put together um, basically other allocations for the units that were assigned to this property. And they'll be incorporated in our next housing element cycle. But it's a combo of uh, ADUs, uh, one site that was actually a state a uh, nursing facility that is uh, the state is decommissioned and is now available for private development. And then we have one, a live application for an all affordable 36 units. So with regard to the, uh, the neighbor issue, uh, I, I did communicate back and forth between the neighbor and property owner. And uh, we're, we're recommending one added condition here and that would be just to adjust the, the old light standard um, that are in the parking lot now. All the parking lot lighting will be uh, new with this project, but in the meantime, we're uh, adding a condition that they adjust to avoid trespass onto the neighboring property. And then I added an optional condition of adding a wood cap to the masonry wall. Um, the reason why I'm adding this as optional is because I, I think the owner wants to speak to this and and uh, thinks that there are some variables and, and practical issues associated with it, but uh, it's certainly justifiable uh, as, a, as a design review finding. Uh, and there's a nexus for it because the, uh, the new hotel needs the existing parking in order to meet the parking standard. So uh, within the commission's purview to require, and I just pulled these off of the internet, it would be something like this. And so uh, I do have a couple of slides after our recommendation, but with all of that, we are recommending approval of the project. Uh, but so much goes into these designs that I just wanted to uh, pay respect to the architect and just pause on a couple of their um, materials board, their uh, inspirational images and uh, some of their renderings. So I'll just pause for six or eight seconds on a couple of these. All right, that's my presentation. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions of staff? Um, I guess I have a question and it involves um, all of the, I don't wanna say concessions perhaps that the applicant made. Um, 
he seems to have been very cooperative. I was wondering, you know, sometimes uh, it's possible that staff gets over enthusiastic and trying to um, be very specific in terms of the requirements and making sure the, the neighbors are happy and whatnot. I was just wondering if the applicant uh, wanted to push back on any of the uh, conditions that we're imposing or the staff is recommend, met, recommending because uh, the commission has an opportunity to, to change those. It, it, I, I don't think we reached agreement on the wall cap. So that's why I left it as an optional condition. I think the owner does want to want to discuss that this evening. Okay, well then if there are no questions of staff on this presentation, then let's move on to public comment and let, uh, let him have his say. The applicant wish to speak. Hello, uh, my name is Dan Patel. <clears throat> I'm the uh, owner of the Quality Hill uh, Quality Inn, and um, also this new project, the 42 unit project. Um, we did basically uh, took the neighbors' concerns, um, and the one concern that is still out there is the. Uh, the wall. So what I was suggesting was that we put um, uh, what um, Brian suggested was to do a wood, maybe just for, for that one neighbor, because the ivy is going to be growing. So everything's going to look green. Um, uh, that was my suggestion uh, uh, today. But the lighting and um, the cars idling, that won't be happening because we have uh, exact parking for auto only. So right now, the reason for the idling is because we have extra spaces. So sometimes we get uh, movers, you know, like rider trucks that'll come and park and they'll be idling their uh, trucks. Um, but once in a while that'll happen, but we'll go out there and take care of that. But after this new hotel comes in, uh, that won't be a question. So um, that, that's my uh, suggestion on the wall issue. So could, could I have a clarification on that? Or maybe I misheard it. You, you want to put the three foot wall just in front of that one neighbor's house? Correct. Well, that was a suggestion. And then because I think all the other neighbor doesn't have a problem. So um, basically we could um, do, uh, it's going to be a um, Ivy. Um, Gwen could uh, help out on this uh, because she's on on this too. She's if you could come on, Gwen. But your but your initial your initial comment was, and you know, I saw your letter this afternoon was that your your trellis basically covered the privacy issue. It does. And that's it still does. your preferred preferred it, method. It 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 is yes. Thank you. Uh, do you have any other comments on other any of the other conditions that uh, you would wish to uh, make a point on? Um, no, none at all. Okay, then, um, then uh, Brian, are there any other public comments? Brian, I believe you're muted. Yep, I'm seeing Peter Felice. Sean, could you please unmute him? Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Great. This is uh, Pete Felice, uh, 714 Hill Street owner. And just a quick question to uh, Mr. Patel. The, uh, the screening that you're proposing for the privacy issue uh, with the Ivy and all that's going to go across the entire uh, length of all of our properties, correct? It's, uh, that's the proposal. So it'll start with my property at 714 and go all the way across where the properties, uh, where the properties meet, where your property and our properties meet. So Mr. Felice, this is not a discussion panel. Uh, you have three minutes to make your point or raise your questions, and then we'll move on. 
but sure. But we that get was, into we that, get into trouble when we get into dialogues. Sure, sure. That 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 is my only question: is the placement of the uh, the proposed placement of the uh, uh, lattice fence with the ivy on it? Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments, Brian, or questions? I guess comments is what we're looking for. Yep, we have Bill Babcock. Sean, if you wouldn't mind unmuting him, please. Hello. We can hear you. Oh, hi. <clears throat> uh, good evening, commissioners. Um, basically, um, uh, I think this is a good project. I think it's good for uh, Capitola and it's long time coming. And uh, the, the hotel <clears throat> has been very good about handling like moving trucks, large trucks that will let their engines idle way into the night. And we call over to the night desk and they rectify it. <clears throat> but what's I think what I wrote an email, which I hope you all have. And um, it's basically uh, really down to um, the, the height of the wall. Um, the lattice, seven feet, you know, um, we get occasionally um, trash tossed over the existing wall. That's one thing. And um, and then, of course, privacy, because it's a, such a, a low wall um, uh, under five feet. So um, so it, it really comes down to where I have a um, hedge that I grew, I think, three decades or two decades ago uh, with the old, um, the other owner, the previous owner of the hotel who gave its blessing and everything of that. And over the years it's you know um it's just depleted and so what's happened is that we do not have privacy when people or trucks park up and they you know get out of the cars and they're looking right into our backyard so i grew another hedge um in, in the house you know covering our our main windows of the kitchens and things like that so effectively it's uh created a part of the backyard to be non-use due to privacy and then uh, and then the noise factor. So we're really open, we're for the project. Um, all we're asking for is to heighten the fence a little bit so it discourages somebody, you know, of course, looking over um, and, and throwing anything over. You know, be, be, people do what they do, these are guests. And, and the hotel management's trying to control them. Um, and we totally get that. And that's why we've been tolerant and working with them for decades now. So um, since 1988. So that's all we're asking for. Um, and we, when I looked at the trellis that's proposed, it's made out of lattice and, and wooden and it only goes up seven feet. And um, another foot would do it, you know, eight feet, uh, um, if that's a possibility, or um, what was proposed as another option is put a wooden cap on it. And um, we're, we're open um, on that. We just wanna end up with having our peace and enjoyment of Capitola and where we live and pass it on to our kids where we live now. And that essentially is, is it. And um, that I have to discuss about tonight. Okay, thank you, Mr. Babcock. You're welcome. Um, other comments? Yep, we have one email, uh, Bob Lashley. I'll just read it. It says, hi, the wall height issue impacts all adjacent neighboring properties. Would you please comment further on, quote, Ivy, unquote, growth, question mark, Bob? Okay, sounds like we are, we've got one issue we're focusing on. Other comments? 
no more. Uh, Bob Lashley has sent another email. <laughs> there is also an enormous problem with gophers on this currently vacant property. These rodents visit the adjacent properties regularly. Excavation is likely to drive the rodents onto neighboring properties more permanently. Is it possible to do an abatement prior to excavation so adjoining properties aren't destroyed by them? Okay, let's not uh, let's not go back and forth again with 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 multiple uh, multiple uh, neighbors. Um, are there any other new comments? No more comments. No hands raised. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Let's move on then to commission deliberation. Does anybody wish to, on the commission, wish to chime in on this issue? Was it, uh, Brian, do you have that screen again with those two additional conditions? Could you put that up, please? <clears throat> okay, that solves the problem of the wall. If we adopt those two conditions, I don't have any problem with the project. I think okay, done. I don't see anybody with their hands up. Does anybody want to make a motion? I'll make I'll a motion. Go ahead, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a motion to approve um, this project, and I completely agree with Brian that it's a beautiful architectural package with all of the bells and whistles. Do you want and to add the two conditions, 55 and 56? Definitely want to add 55 and 56. And um, yeah. So, yeah, this is Commissioner Newman. I'll second it and say that it's kind of a tribute to the applicant and his architect that uh, a big project like this comes down to just one wall is about all we had to discuss. That's good. That is true. I we have a, uh, a motion and a second uh, discussions. Um, yeah, I, I would like to weigh in as, as well and, and thank the, uh, the applicant for his, his time and, 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 and effort and expense. And I know this is a long, arduous process and I appreciate his, his putting up with, um, with, with the process. And, but, I, but I think it's, we, we've come up with something that both he and the community and capital are going to be very proud of. So um, are there any other, any other comments before we have a vote? Okay, Louie, can we have a roll call vote? Yes, yes. Commissioner Christensen? Yes. Commissioner Newman? Yes. Commissioner Westman? Yes. Mr. Maru? Aye. Yeah, well. Aye. Uh, motion passes unanimously. Good luck on your project. Uh, let's move on then to the director's report. Do we have a director's report? <laughs> Sorry about that, a little peekaboo. Um, I did want to want to bring to you, your attention uh, one new project that's come in, and uh, let's. I'm going to stop sharing the screen at this point, if you don't. Um, and just there's a project, a conceptual review that was submitted for 3720 Capitola Road, and this is across from Target. There's a kennel. I'll be bringing this to you at our next planning commission hearing. Um, and it is for a um, assisted living facility, I believe up to, I think they're proposing four stories. They wanna utilize a section of code that we have not yet utilized for incentives for uh, commun the community benefits section of code in which you can get a higher floor area ratio and height if you bring in a community benefit. So, it's an assisted living facility. I think the one of the floors is for memory care and included in that um, is that the owner has bought the property in Capitola as well as the adjacent property behind it, which is in the county. So they'll be seeking an annexation into the city to combine the two properties. So um, 
think it's going to be a, a great one to review. We have RRM looking at the design. Um, we're trying to take care, check off a couple boxes of the preliminary requirement for design review, as well as conceptual review when you do a um, a a community benefit project. That's one of the one step is the requirement for conceptual review. So looking forward to hearing your comments on that at the next meeting. And other than that, I appreciate all the thoughtful comments this evening and especially um, all the time and energy that went into the hotel this evening and, the, um, and our prototype design. So thank you all. Thank you, Katie. Um, commission comments. Uh, my comment is what would the staff like us to do with these containers that were dropped off at our houses? <laughs> Why don't leave them outside your house tomorrow and we can swing by and pick them up? Does okay. That sounds That's good. Fine. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> There's a container outside my house. I'm not at home. <laughs> I still have a container from years ago. <laughs> pick it up, Peter. You won't even, <laughs> you won't miss it. All right. Any other comments? If not, this meeting is adjourned. Good night, Good night everybody. everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>